I'm disappointed in you, and I want you to try it again. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's good. It's my new vibe. But it's like angry fun. It's your new energy. <laughs> the, Neil I, the Neil I Patel story. Yeah. <laughs> he seemed so angry, but he was having such a good time. All right, one more time. Ready? <laughs> oh. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, we are recording. The reason I said, like, don't just, like, randomly heckle us. One... That sucks. I'm very Two, delicate. <laughs> uh, we are taping this. It's going out as a richcast tomorrow. So be respectful for the audience in their cars. Uh, there are some cameras that are taping us. So just know that this will go out as a video tomorrow as well. And those, I think, are the only notes that I have to give. Yeah. Do you have any ideas? Uh, I don't. Have you? There's ha- no costumes. Have you house capped before? Oh, uh, bummer. Okay. <laughs> Greetings, mobile accomplisher. <laughs> yeah, it's all. It's all happening. All right. Let me open. If you just had a Windows computer, you could just have Face ID. I hate you. Okay. I mean, I really like you, but I... It's a Vergecast, everybody. Okay. (laughs) Andrew, are we ready? So here's the thing about Uh, the Vergecast. Before we start every show, we all go around the room and say, have you hit record? mm -hmm. Because sometimes we've forgotten. (laughs) Okay. We hit record? All right. Ready? You ready over here? We're ready. Actual Rock guests. Roll. Really ready. <laughs> Functional you, executives you from real talk, companies. You said to talk close, but... <laughs> You're very far Too away. close. Hello. Yeah, this is good. Well, now we're going to get one... We're going to get one person from the audience to stand right in the center of this. <laughs> we have some room That's how we're going to do questions. Actually. It's going to be cool. Okay. Hello, and welcome to The Verge Cast, the flagship podcast of The Verge Family of websites. Dot situation. Dot situ- is there a dot situation? I'm your friend Eli. Dieter Bone is here. Hello, hello. Ashley Carmen is here. Hello. And this is actually a really special episode of the Vergecast. We're live at Mozilla's Glassroom in San Francisco. We've got a crowd. The crowd is here. <laughs> Pretty good. And we have two very special guests. We have Isaac Reynolds from Google. Hello. Uh, and Robbie Stein from Instagram. Go on. Uh, and we're going to talk about photos, how we make them, how we share them, how we, how we talk about them. I'm literally, I told both of them earlier, the first question is, what is a photo? And that's just going to take us into the entire night. <laughs> uh, it is also literally Halloween. Yep. Uh, and the verse... Also, it's my dad's birthday. Happy birthday, Dad. Aw, that's sweet. Well, now I can't say the mean thing. <laughs> uh, but the verse also turns eight on November 1. So it's going to just be, too, everyone's in like a great mood. We're going to have some drinks later. So if you're listening to this in your car and it seems like it's getting a little sideways, just know it was, it was Halloween yep. uh, and it's our birthday party. And like, you can't get too mad at us. Okay, let's start. So uh, Isaac and Robbie, I want to ask you both. Uh, <clears throat> Robbie, you are the director of product at Instagram. Describe what that entails. Sure. So I support the consumer product team focused on stories, feed, messaging, and the, the tools that help you connect and share with people you care about. And so I've been at Instagram for three and a half years. Our team originally launched stories. We've done changes to feed, like the multiple posts to feed, indirect messages, being able to share uh, photos more easily, creative tools with the camera, like Super Zoom and Boomerang. It's so all that fun stuff. Yeah. And Isaac, you're the product manager of the Pixel camera. Right, so I'm the lead product manager on the Pixel camera, focused on software. So I uh, help the team put together a roadmap for the coming years of what we're going to do in computational photography and try to change how people think about taking photos and taking videos and things like that. So having the two of you together on a stage at this conversation is, is particularly interesting to me. I'm very excited about it. We're, first of all, we're just in the moment in the tech cycle where all the cameras came out. And so it's always like a moment that prompts me to think about photos. And then I think the feedback loop of the tools we use to create the photos, and then we share them, and you see trends across platforms like Instagram feeding back into the creative tools. There's not like a vergier thing. Like that's the project. I think we, we started the entire site. To, it's our birthday. I'm being very interested. <laughs> Happy birthday. Uh, but that's like, why, that's like why we have it. That's like why we made the thing is these tools help us democratize creation. So I'm very excited to, to have you both here together. And I do want to start with this photo, that, that, with this question that is, it sounds a little silly, and it's a little philosophical. It is extremely Dieter Bone in its way. Um, <laughs> but the very nature of what a photo is has changed. And it's changed both in how you are creating them with computational photography. We're no longer capturing one instant in time. We're capturing like several slices, and then he's just smiling at me. He's like, it's a photo. Um, <laughs> it's nuanced. Yeah. Uh, and then Robbie, like Instagram, just at its core, is filters and AR effects and like, the very notion that the first thing you create is just a 
straight photo is like you're way off on the other end of the spectrum. So, uh, uh, Isaac, let's start with you. What is a photo? Do you take photos? Do you make them? I never take photos. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, I was going to say, if I had to boil it down just a couple of words, I would probably say that a photo is a memory more than anything else. Aww. Uh, so we focus it on... Uh, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> it's very nice. It's not, it's not a sarcastic awe. I really uh, like that. I was serious. Uh, it's about reminiscing and remembering and uh, capturing moments forever that maybe you couldn't capture before. So Night Sight, for example, is our, our kind of very, very ultra low light mode. And one of the reasons I love it is because it lets people take pictures they never could before, which to me is a memory you never could have had before. It's a memory that would have deteriorated over the years. That is very extremely depressing existential. <laughs> <laughs> but now with Pixel. <laughs> uh, all right, Robbie, what's, what's a photo? Well, I think I'll give you the Instagram answer, um, which I think from an Instagram perspective, and this is something that how I view photos personally, um, it's the best way to capture and share what you're doing, thinking, and feeling. And I think for us, and for me, and like how I use photos probably more times than not, it's actually for the purpose of sharing and communicating information. So when I think of, a, well, I think when most people think of a photo, they're like, I push the shutter, we like slice, like capture it, that moment is frozen. But Isaac, like that is no longer what anyone is doing in computational photography. You're taking several slices of time. You're merging them together. Do you think that, that has changed your understanding of what the actual final product is as a photo? Do you think people need to think about it differently? I don't, I don't think so. And the, the reason is because at the end of the day, we, we take all these images together and we pick one of them to be the photo. And when we merge all the other photos into that one, we keep that base, we call it a base frame. And that moment in time really happened. It was completely real. And all the other images that we merge into it just go to making that you know, cleaner, sharper, look nicer. Enhancing reality. Im improving <laughs> reality. You see where it gets fuzzy? Uh, it could get fuzzy, yeah. Uh, I'll give you a one way it could get really fuzzy in the future, which is uh, if you know what a thing was supposed to look like, it can help you denoise the image that you took of that thing and make it look sharper. Is it cheating to take away the noise because you know it's noise? Like, is the, the, the noise itself is not the photo. Um, and you had to know what the photo was supposed to look like to take the noise away, but it, that doesn't make it fake. So there's a whole, there's this huge amount of computation and nuance that goes into the image that you get. And it's, uh, it's definitely a fine line that we try to walk. Is there, a, is there a far boundary that you won't cross? Ooh. Like, yeah. for example, on, I know that I'm very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> My camera seems awfully confused about how handsome I am. <laughs> yeah, there are certainly lines that we won't cross. Um, uh, we at, at Google, as a, as a company, think it's important to worry about uh, a face retouching and beautification. There are certain lines in there that we won't cross. Like, we want everyone to look like the most uh, authentic and best version of themselves which doesn't mean modifying people. But how do you balance people's need to look good in their selfies? Like, I want to look good. <laughs> <laughs> you do look good, and, right? and if I'm going to share it to Instagram, like, and Instagram is willing to make me look better, how do you kind of think about... Well, this, this is where the interface between an app like Instagram and an app like a Pixel camera comes into play. Because a lot of our responsibility is to put a file on disk that is really flexible and useful to whatever editor, whatever platform, whatever device or display or screen is going to see it next. Um, so we focus on low light, detail, dynamic range, color accuracy, uh, and giving you the most flexible thing you can work with later on. So Robbie, is that, is, is that how you think of it too? Because you, on the other hand, it's the first thing you do in Instagram is edit. Right? You're, you, you, the assumption I think that you probably have is that people are going to start modifying the image. So do you have a far line or is there like, we just know it's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, we want to, like the point of the Instagram camera is to share and communicate what you're doing, what you're thinking, and what you're feeling. And so we want to inspire you to be able to share and connect, feel comfortable doing that, and be able to actually interact with people. And what we do is we take the core use cases of what, why people use our camera, and a lot of times, 
they're actually communicating feelings and emotions. So it's things like, I love this, or wow, this is awesome. And so what we'll do is we'll use AR and inject, like in Super Zoom, like the multiple hearts that like zoom in slowly with like a twinkle music, and it's like, wow, I'm obsessed with this thing. So for us, it's about the expressive and emotional aspects of the camera that we try to do. Um, and we kind of focus on those use cases much more than all the fine-grained things around kind of how you look. So if, if you're thinking of photos primarily as a mode of communication and expression, does that mean that you're just not really, you don't have any stress about whether or not the photo represents like a documentary truth of a moment in time because the, the whole purpose of it is to modify it and, and send it out? No, I mean, I think we do care about what it looks like because the point of the share is that you want to bring someone close to you and say, oh, I felt like I was with you when you were eating that pizza or I was with you when you were really angry when your sports team lost the World Series. Yeah. Mine actually won, so I was very happy. <laughs> uh, but like, worked that right in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you want to feel authentic because you want to really feel connected. Like you were there with your friend basically through the camera. So it does matter to us. We do look at camera quality. We do look at overall quality of the photo and we do a bunch to make it faster um, and make it feel like a, something that represents the moment you had. What's the feeling that people are trying to communicate when they use a photo that just make, or use a filter that makes them look really good? It could be playful, just like I'm feeling goofy or bored, or sometimes just a post to get a reply from someone and then start a conversation on direct because like you just want to hang and you're bored. See that all the time from users. They talk about that pretty frequently. Um, or they'll just post and say, like, I'm bored, hit me up. So one thing I have been thinking about a lot as we kind of review this next generation of cameras and phones in particular is that the Pixel has a very obvious look. Like, I'm pretty consistent, I can spot the pixel photo out of like, uh, when we do our photo tests. I can always tell which one is a pixel. It's contrasty, it, it has really neutral colors, it's great. You did good, good. I like your, I like your camera. We're done here, that's it. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's a, it's a very clear look. And we were talking to Mark Lavoie at the recent hardware event, he said, we know we have a look. This year we changed the look a little bit. Instagram is like, all trends and looks all the time. Like it's moving ever faster. Where do you see that feedback loop coming when you want to change the look of a pixel camera year to year? What drives that? It is it is it okay, we know that this look is popular on the on the social platforms. Is it we instinctively want to change it ourselves? Is it Annie Leibowitz yelled at us a lot? Like, <laughs> Which happened, by the way. <laughs> that's, what my, that's, that's some really the answer I'm hoping for here, is like a long digression on Annie Leibowitz like yelling at the pixel team. <laughs> um, but like what are the inputs for you? When you, because you're only changing it year to year, whereas I see on Instagram, it's like week to week. Well, you, users is the big input. Yeah. Um, that's why I like to come places like this. I get to learn what users want. Um, but to be honest, when you build the camera, you kind of become a little bit of a tastemaker. Um, so all the people out there who shoot with Pixel and share their Pixel photos are creating almost virally a, that, that look. And the people who shoot with Pixel for years become attached to that look. So we take our role as tastemakers very, very seriously. Um, we have a team of, of people who are very, very deeply embedded in image quality. And you know, part of that is noise and detail, and part of that is the subjective look that you're talking about. We call it the signature look. Uh, I think uh, Mark likes to say it's based on his own personal love for, and I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, Caravaggio, uh, the paintings. A very deep, moody, dark, beautiful look. It happens to look really good for landscapes in particular and sunsets. Um, but when we go out and change it, uh, it's usually because we've heard some strong feedback that, you know, maybe this look works in some place, but not in another place. Uh, and so one of the things that we're learning to do is treat different images differently, different parts of images differently, to try to make sure that everything gets the, the, the style that it should and deserves, um, even when, you know, half the photo is this beautiful sunset and half the photo is a, a portrait. But, I, I don't know, the Pixel 2 came out, it was the first you know, really aggressive HDR camera in, in that way. Uh, first really successful computational photography camera. Obviously Apple followed, like the HDR look where everything is very flat and the shadows are brought up and the highlights were dropped down. Like that just became what photos looked like. That is not what photos have, like everyone's photos didn't look like that until the Pixel 2 and, and sort of the Apple phones came out. Did you think, oh crap, we changed how people think about photos? Like, did you have that moment of the feedback loop in the world is most photos now are 
this much flatter. I think it was more, this is cool. <laughs> um, yeah, you were like, Eric, I'm on the winning team. <laughs> we weren't so happy about the flat look. Yeah. Mm. So uh, one of the reasons HDR Plus, that signature look is so moody is because we didn't want that flat look. Yeah. And uh, HDR Plus, I don't think has ever had that flat look. That flat look is associated with the uh, traditional HDR bracketing algorithms of yesteryear. Um, and it's something we designed HDR Plus not to do from the outset. Uh, so I think it's really cool that like software is now becoming a much bigger part of image processing. We're glad to be a part of it. We're glad to have helped kick it off. Um, uh, but not that flat look. We're not a fan of that. <laughs> so Robbie, you also, obviously people use your camera. Do you ever think, oh, we need to build an HDR pipeline in this camera. We need to have a signature look for the Instagram app. Or is it you're going to put freckles on your face even though you don't have freckles? Like, let's just, let's just get it done. I mean, I think there's a certain amount of standardization you want just because people have a need to feel like they're more reliably getting the same enjoyment from a product over and over again. And so you don't want to depart too far because it's confusing and frustrating to people. And I think that Instagram, based on the filter style that we do have, there's a consistent palette and transparency instead of... Um, kind of colors that we typically do use, like even for the swipe over filters that have a some they're on this, in the same language. And I think you'll notice when you use like the Rio filter and it's got that like pink kind of semi-transparent gradient. Um, and people recognize that. And I do think that's important for kind of the reason I mentioned. But we actually just redesigned our camera just a couple months ago and just did a, a launch with a whole bunch of new effects that are now discoverable with AR and the new formats like Super Zoom and Boomerang. And we're starting to see that actually the formats are also as distinctive as any of the color as well. It's like when you see the boomerang looping GIF or you see the like funny like zoom into the face of your friend, like you know it's Instagram. And I think it's because we built something that matters and when people use it, they get a certain joy out of it. But we think it's important to keep that consistency long term so that people have an expectation that's still there. How do you think about the, the cadence of creating those effects and even, even the camera releases? Is like pixels and iPhones generally are like, about once a year, there'll be a big jump forward, and you are doing stuff once a week or once every two weeks. Yeah, I mean, for us, we're not really trying to recreate the core underlying camera, but more um, extending it in interesting ways, and it just works through the use cases of why would you want to use Instagram, and ultimately, the point of Instagram is to connect and um, you know, be brought closer to the people that really matter to you, and if that's expressing a certain feeling or a certain mood, we can just build something on top of the camera as fast as we want. And so when we built the original version of Super Zoom, we we're like, it would people really express humor through the camera. Like it's really used to to be funny, but yet no one's really created a product that helps you be really really funny all the time through the camera. And so we were like, okay, let's try this weird Zoom thing that took this kind of kung fu video shot, and we actually watched a bunch of YouTube videos <laughs> of like these old school like. Kung Fu video kind of funny mock uh, zoom ins where you like miss your friend intentionally and then it like cuts back over. And we're like, this is actually pretty funny. And Dramatic Chipmunk was like another version of it. Mm. So we built it, we prototyped it, and we just shipped it and in completely independent of any re release cycle of like underlying camera technology. I feel like Super Zoom came about though originally from users doing the like quick finger up zoom. Like who, who's who do you think is the stronger tastemaker on Instagram? The, like, are you watching what the users are doing and then deciding, or are you guys going completely off on your own, doing research, thinking about? Users are really, are really, really critical to what we build. And I think we did notice that people would zoom in very quickly. Yeah. Um, but it, that, the, the specific example of Super Zoom was probably, because it has more humor associated with it, it was probably just more less about that zooming motion, but more that people wanted to do something, express that, that something was funny. And then the other one was we just saw that people were adding all of these hearts and heart eyes into every single camera. Like, wow, people keep using the camera to basically express, I love this thing, like, this is epic, like, whatever it is. And so we should build a whole bunch of tools and make that much more expressive with the camera. And then we got to the Zoop or Zoom hearts experiences and heart eyes and a bunch of the other AR filters that we added. Am I allowed to comment as yeah. well? My <laughs> dream is that you two just talk to each other. And, and we just sit back. Yeah. If okay. you're like a podcast hope and you're like, yeah. My guests are just talking, and I'm just like gonna like be on Twitter. Like that's perfect. Yeah. Um, but go ahead. Yeah. No, I was gonna say uh, you talk about people zooming in when they're taking Instagram videos, and they're zooming really fast. You zoom in a little bit, you come back a little. You know, the, the Instagram, uh, not the Instagram, but the dramatic chipmunk, chipmunk look. You know, people use the Pixel default camera very differently from that. From us, when you pinch zoom in, and you go too far, and you have to come back or you go a little bit to the right and you miss the subject and you have to pan it back to the left. For us, that's like embedded in your memory forever now. Like you can never remake that video. 
it's done. It's, it's, it's in bits now. It can't be changed. So we see that as like this horrible mistake. <laughs> um, but it's funny. <laughs> So, so this gets, I mean, this is like the heart of it. Like it, one of the notes we have is like, what are the jobs that these apps do, that these cameras do? And it seems like you have identified two very different jobs, but there's a pretty clear overlap, which is the Instagram grid, right? Which is, yes. okay, this is my most perfect photo. I'm sharing it. Gaze upon the identity that I've constructed. <laughs> Pay me to hawk your pretty products. Good. Yeah. Uh, no, I've got a perfect Instagram presence. Um, but like that's the Instagram grid in particular is where you want your your best stuff. Do you see people using your camera for that, or are they using the create mode for stories? They, they do both, but I think our cameras use more for stories because our tool set is so geared to the job of sharing in the way where you're using the camera specifically to share this moment and this expression and this feeling. And it's funny that you said that, oh, this is a terrible mistake because you want to relive this moment <laughs> and this moment doesn't exist. For stories producer, you're like, yeah, I want to put something on my stories. I like never want to see that thing again. Like I don't, <laughs> I not only don't want to remember it, I like am sometimes embarrassed that's there and it's great. It's ephemeral and it goes away because I'm just sharing a really goofy moment where I just, I was bored and I was eating something. And I was like, oh, this is going to be stupid, but I'm just going to put this on stories. And I got a bunch of people right back to me. I got to connect with people I wouldn't have spoken to. And that was the purpose of using the camera. It was never to have this artifact that I was going to treasure. But um, do you find that people go back to the archive? They do. Um, and I think because... <laughs> I look at my stories. Well, there's <laughs> lots of... <laughs> That's a very personal question. Well, the thing is that there's a lot of diversity in the use cases. And people use stories when they're at a wedding and they're taking a bunch of stories throughout and those are really fun things or you're going for a walk or it's beautiful. I do all kinds of stuff. But there's certainly a class of stories that are like, you just don't worry about. You're just putting them on there. Um, but for Fida, I agree. Like That one is much more about highlights and about this kind of sense of this, um, this memory and memorialization of like the things that you're into. And if someone's never met you before, what would they think about you? What would they know about you? What should they know about you? And you get a very quick sense, like, okay, you have your kids, or at least mine, kids, and travel, and food, and family. Like, those are the things that are really important to me. And they're two different jobs that live in one product for us. We have to ask. Yeah, I mean, Ashley Here it comes. <laughs> Ashley's been waiting to ask this question all day. Did stories destroy the grid? Did Is anyone still destroy? using the grid? I use the grid. Okay, you use the Maybe grid. Maybe I'm a little lame. Other than him. One extraordinarily than him. important <laughs> user of the grid. <laughs> yes, people yeah. love the grid. They really do. People, people love the profile and the grid. I think for a lot of people, it is the main way, their main representation of themselves on the internet. Like, it really is. And if you've never met me before or where you go to school together, you go to my Instagram profile and you get a quick sense of who I am. And it really matters to people. So people do still spend a lot of time thinking about it, and, and they really enjoy it. But do you see in the in the sort of your daily usage numbers the shift towards stories? I mean, stories is definitely a place that can accommodate more use cases because it's just, just this kind of effortless place where you don't have to think too much about it. You just post. And so you definitely see much more of like the everyday casual use case, which was the purpose of stories. And when we originally launched it, it was because we realized people were having to be so considered in feed and it was too difficult to really be like, oh, is this really like some good enough to go on feed and then be on my grid and live on forever? Like, man, maybe not. Um, and so we do see a lot, a lot of casual usage on stories. Do you, so when you open the, it's create mode, when you slide, slide over to it's camera, camera. Yeah. Um, so that's the video camera. Do you think, oh, we got a, this needs to start being a 4K video camera. This needs to be a super high-end video camera. Or are you more focused on the creative tools on top of it? Well, it gets back to the jobs. You know, what, wh why is someone hiring the Instagram camera? And if it's ultimately to communicate. Wait, can I stop you? Did sure. you all know Silicon Valley product manager speak? That's how they all talk. Oh, yeah, I'll explain <laughs> the job thing. Every single one of you is hiring a software product every day. <laughs> um, there's no HR department. You can fire the software product at will. You know, it's but, the, 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 the you can fire one too, though. Yeah. You can. Okay. You can fire whatever you want. It's very liberating. I encourage everyone to fire two products tonight, <laughs> <laughs> but preferably not Instagram products. <laughs> anyway, keep going. Anyway, so the jobs thing is like, it's just helpful to think about not people using products, but they hire it to do something for them. And it helps you just think, okay, people wanting to get something out of the product, that's why they're using it. And for us, it's not to get this crazy, dense memory that you're going to relive and think about all the time. It's, again, it's just to communicate something kind of, sometimes really goofy and sometimes completely like you don't ever want to see again. So 4K is not something that we focus a ton on and probably won't in the short term. Are most people using effects on their stories? Yeah. Or is it, yeah. I'm getting the sense that reality is really boring for you guys. 
<laughs> well, again, this is a split, right? I mean, yeah, here we're boring. like, we're going to enhance reality. It's not boring. It's just that I think when you're trying to express something, part of it's the photo. Part of it's, well, what am I thinking about it? You put a little gift thing in there that's fun and that explains, like, how excited you are about something. It communicates more than just yeah. a, a, a smile. is not good enough anymore. Yeah. So, Isaac, how <laughs> much are you thinking about <laughs> the things that are happening to these photos in when you're thinking about how to process a photo? Because when, like, there's going to be an output, right? It's going to get saved in Google Photos. It's going to get uh, sent as an MMS that is crushed and terrible and awful. <laughs> Nina, we, would you like to talk about should, RCS should we now? talk about <laughs> No. No, I, no, I wouldn't. Or like, it's going to go into Instagram and it's going to, you know, maybe maybe if you're lucky, it'll go on a story or it might go on the grid. How much are you thinking about those outputs when you're trying to save your ideal bits to disk? It's, it's definitely on our list. Uh, but actually, what's bigger on our list, which is funny to hear you, Robbie, talk about the feed versus the stories. Because as much as you talk about the feed being really hard to deal with and lots of effort and lots of investment. Like, I would be very happy if your Google Photos grid was your feed because you only had to take one photo in each situation and that photo was incredible and you didn't have to work for it. Like, I would be very happy if that were, that were the reality. Mm. Um, but You can make a button that makes that maybe one, one tap. Uh, we have share extensions. <laughs> oh my feel God. Free to, feel free. Oh. This is my dream. <laughs> Android t- Product. Can we negotiate hey, this we'll right be, here, hey, right We're, we're going to be a, just get a whiteboard and like <laughs> make a new thing. We'll, we'll, yeah, 20 minutes, we'll be back. Is that yeah, cool? Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, but in terms of how we think about where the photo's going, the biggest thing for us is all the detail has to be there. Because we always say that it's uh, really easy to take detail away and cover it up with something else, like red hearts. Uh, <laughs> but it's really hard to add the detail back if it wasn't there in the beginning. Uh, so one of my least favorite sort of responses to how nerdy I am about photos and our reviews is it doesn't matter, it's just going on Instagram, right? You don't have to like crop into the photos as closely as you do and be like, this, these five pixels are sharper on this photo and this camera versus the other because it's just going on Instagram. One, I, I personally find that frustrating because... The photos live for much longer than a phone, so I prefer to always have the best photo because it's going to hopefully transcend like this moment in time. And second, I'm pretty sure that you guys are going back and improving the display of photos in the archive over time. So I, I actually, is that true? Or do, you, do you think about this photo from 2012, we should actually recompress it to make it better versus the input that we have, or is that just lost to the mists? No, I mean, I think we're uploading what we think is the best trade-off between being able to upload it relatively quickly, not kill your battery, and get it to people that want to see it. And then at the time, the parameters just change based on the quality of the camera, phone, phone bandwidth. And so if you go back to your Instagram and your old stuff, it's going to look a little jankier. But that's staying static. You're, yeah. not, you're not improving not that, that stuff. I'm aware. I haven't heard of that. Not well, that you, I'm aware. You, <laughs> I mean, you, you'd be surprised how many layers of software there actually are going on there. There are transcoders. So you, know, you basically have a file in a server. And somehow that has to become a file on your phone. And to do that, you have to turn it into some co- other kind of file, send it over an internet connection, turn it into some other kind of file, and then show it on a screen which has its own code in it. All those, there's a shocking number of layers and transformations that happen. And even something as simple as taking a low res image and turning it into a high res image, which is something called upscaling, there are really simple ways to do that, and there are really incredibly advanced ways to do that. And so, like in Pixel Camera, we have a range of upscalers for all sorts of different purposes. But if you feel like the photos are getting better in the archive, it may simply be there's some software layer running on the phone that is like completely invisible to Instagram that is magically making them better through better upscaling. Do you think about Instagram as an output as you are planning out camera features? Are you thinking most people are just going to share about? What what are the things, what are the sort of metrics of this is happening in Instagram that influences what you guys are doing? Uh, well, th- well, the biggest thing is uh, just we know that people are going to be using Instagram camera. We know they're going to be sending their photos there. So uh, I'll give you a very concrete example. Um, we think a lot about like aspect ratios is one big thing where we this think of... so after my own heart. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're going to do an hour on in, this, please. In, in Pixel 4, we actually moved the control over the aspect ratio from deep, deep in settings, much, much closer to the, to the user. And the reason for that was because uh, your feed has a particular aspect ratio which is different from your story's aspect ratio. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and that... <laughs> all I'm... Sorry, trying to... The, the hey, like, we were designing absolutely. products five minutes ago, and I tried to break us up already. <laughs> <laughs> but it is very important when you take the photo to know whether it's going to go on the feed where it's square, yeah. or stories where it's not square, or sometimes in your grid it's square, like when you're looking through your, through your own grid on, on the feed, it's square, but when you look at it, like scroll through other people's photos, they can be varying degrees of rectangular. 
Um, so when we were trying to make a decision about what aspect ratio should we have, should it be full screen or 16 by nine or four by three or two by three or one by one or circle, like crazy number of ratios, I actually went and I looked at all the ratios and I took a single picture in that ratio and I cropped it to all the different ways it could show up on Instagram. And that is how we picked what should be the ratios that we offer on the camera and which one should be the default. Because I wanted to make sure that when you took a picture, it was going to look good on Instagram. Are there, that's really nice. <laughs> You're welcome. Dieter's still going to try to start shit. <laughs> By the way, thank you so much for that. It's for my customers, too. That's awesome. There's a, that's really cool. Truly, there's no more Vergecast moment than like, we're trying to start some aspect ratio, like beef right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's, there's, like, this room is like, do it. <laughs> and then, like, everyone else in the world is like, what on earth are you talking about? So, you introduced some creative controls in the camera this year with the HDR sliders. That, that's interesting because there's obviously stuff you're choosing at capture, but then because it's computational photography, there's stuff you can change after capture. How do you think about the sort of, is there a final file or is there this ever changing thing that you can mutate in your zone and you're gonna export it to a place like Instagram? There is, there's a sad transition that we have between in-camera and like pre-capture, post-capture. Yeah. Um, once, so we do all of our processing in what's called a raw file format, which has way more information than, a, than like what ends up on the disk and that goes to Instagram. And so we try to do all of our processing in that raw file. So we do end up throwing a bunch of detail away. So we try to do as much there as we can. Because we know that once it makes it to a place like Instagram, there's a lot less flexibility because you just have a lot less data in that file to play with. So you don't think that just like Apple lets you like change your depth of field after the fact in their portrait mode, that it lives in their app. And then once you're gone, once you're out of their Beautiful prison, like you, get, you never get to. It is beautiful. It's very <laughs> nicely maintained. It's a fucking prison. Um, <laughs> uh, but once you're out of that, like you can't change that anymore. That's like a very proprietary. Like you keep saying disk, and I keep that makes me think of file formats. Like, is there a new photo file format that preserves that beyond just raw? That's oh. like, okay, we're gonna recompute. Oh, it depends on what you want to preserve. Like, yeah. you actually can modify the the blur after the fact for our portrait mode pictures. Uh, you can uh, add blur uh, to some pictures that you know you haven't even taken in portrait mode if you've got the right settings enabled. Um, there's lots you can still do. So you can modify the bokeh. You can turn it into a color pop where it's like uh, the the subject is color and then everything is not only blurred in the background but like grayscale as well. Um, so there are definitely things you can do after the fact, and we have special file formats for all that stuff too. And that, but that's inside your app. Do you think that that stuff should go industry-wide so that you export your photo and now the Instagram app can change the bouquet? Or the Instagram app can do... I would love it if Instagram supported our custom file formats for depth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for tonight. asking that. I appreciate that. <laughs> but, it, but, I mean, that's like a... I mean, to get super nerdy, like, the JPEG standard was like a controversial patent. Like, there's all the stuff of we have to make a file format. So to go from, okay, you're, we're going to ship a JPEG after all this processing, and then you can have it, and you can do whatever you want, to now we're adding layers of recompute that maybe you, you're going to do differently than me. That obviously, that's a whole process. Are you, are you interested in your camera shipping out a file that can do that? Like so the editor can do even more with it than just a simple JPEG? Yeah, so if I wanted to, yeah, if yeah. I wanted to take the, your HDR plus file, and I wanted to do my own computational photography... Ah, right. so we've got all sorts of outputs in camera for, for that, for that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Like, uh, we'll export depth, an actual depth map with every portrait image, so that if you want to modify the, the blur later, you can do that. If you want to do like a 3D photo, you can do that too. Um, we'll attach a little uh, three second video clip with each one of the photos. Um, you can do all sorts of cool stuff with that too. It's actually also got like uh, some little stabilization metadata in it as well, which is kind of interesting. It comes from the gyroscope. Um, we've got raw outputs, so you can actually get this 14-bit HDR plus raw image that you can put into like a Lightroom or a Photoshop or something and do really cool stuff with. Um, so when I talk about, you know, you get an image out of camera and then it's yours, we're actually embedding a lot more in that image than just the, the, the traditional little JPEG. But do you, do you want an ecosystem to develop around that stuff? I mean, it's great that it's all there for you. But if I can't use other editors and tools to make use of it, like it's just it's just actually eating up the storage on my 64 gigabyte Pixel 4 base model, um, <laughs> right? Sorry, that's <laughs> just what I think about. Like, how do you do, how do you build an ecosystem around that additional data? 
Uh, well, the nice thing to do is we piggyback off Android a lot. Okay. Mm. So, for example, the the depth information that we save with a portrait, it's a it's an Android standard, and the Android folks they go work with OEM partners, third party apps such as Instagram, um, and talk about how this file should work and what you should be able to do with it, and then we just piggyback on that. So, uh, Ash and I were talking earlier that like. Apple and Google, they're like, they have this horse race of who can have the best portrait mode. And it seems like Instagram, it's just like, man, do you Did not... Do you have a fake you, portrait mode Do you for care about portrait yeah. mode? We have yeah. portrait mode. Yeah. It's cool. I, I mean, I think there's so much pe people use the camera for, and there's lots of people doing it, that it probably isn't the thing that like everyone's using all the time, because there's lots of great solutions for it. But we thought it was really important to support, and people like it, they use it. But, Yeah. Are there inputs like to this other conversation? Are, is there data you want from cameras that you're not getting as you think about your future roadmap? Like, it would be great if when the camera is lit up, we could use these other three sensors to create a new kind of effect. Like, are you in those conversations, or are you just like, we're gonna get what we get and we're gonna do our thing? I think it would be great. I mean, we meet all we meet frequently, and I, I think it's it would be awesome to get more access to some of the raw information so that we could make it better for the thing you're trying to use it for. Like, low lighting is one thing that comes up all of the time. It's very frequent on Instagram because in social point of Instagram cameras to share stuff mostly. And when you're doing stuff, it's usually poorly lit and you're in a restaurant or in your room or wherever. Um, and it'd be really interesting to be able to tune some of those things more directly um, for that specific use case um, rather than relying particularly on some output that you have to then just reshare if someone wants to use uh, the native camera as their primary camera. So Snapchat is going all in on this 3D mode using the iPhone's depth sensing. What's holding you guys back from that? Is it politics of the deal and accessing the sensors? Why aren't you going in on those filters? Yeah, I think we mostly just look at what's going to be the thing that's going to be the most valuable to lots of people. And a lot of these more experimental, earlier phase things, we typically like to really make sure they're valuable to people before we put a ton of time and effort into them. Like People frequently request um, doing just more advanced camera formats. Um, and we've tried some experiments with them internally, and we've tried testing them and getting some users, but some users don't understand them, they don't capture with them yet. Um, and so we really try to wait until we find something that really is gonna help the whole community more. And that's been, we just had other priorities right now. But do you, do you think that not every, like, I think the iPhone 7 is the most popular iPhone right on the market right now, it's the, the most in use. Are you building towards, okay, we know that not everybody actually has the face ID tech. Not everybody is, has this yet. We're gonna curve into that as there's mass adoption or are you saying we need to be, this just isn't that important? It's mostly just what we think is gonna be most important. I mean, I think if there's something really cutting edge and new that a small group of people are starting to use, it'll, it, but we think it will be really big in the future, we'll probably invest more there because we, we think it'll be really valuable and it's a good investment in over time. Um, but otherwise, if, if it's, we're not sure and we don't have conviction, there are other, there's lots of problems that we, we really know are problems. We're going to focus on those first. I will say this is, this is kind of a chicken and egg problem. So uh, on my side, it's the person capturing the data and putting it on a disk for apps like Instagram to play with. Uh, kind of the data has to be there for Instagram to do something with it. So there's this, there's this funny setting in Pixel, in Pixel 4 that lets you save depth data with every photo that you take. And it's kind of there just in case someone wants to use it. We didn't have the data, no one would use it. So it's there. Um, and there actually are a few, a few good apps making use of it already. Uh, Facebook actually uses it, um, which is really cool. Uh, the the newsfeed does. Um, but we kind of have to lead the industry a little bit on Pixel to make sure the data is available for them to even decide if it's worth doing for their customers. How do you, how do you over time, decide Okay, we built a new hardware feature in the camera. Well, it's an integrated hardware software product, I get it. But we built a new core feature of the camera. We're gonna keep it and keep iterating on it because people are using it versus, well, that was a good idea, but we're gonna drop it and move on to the next thing. I think a lot of it comes down to a similar answer. You know, We think about users. What are users using? What are they doing? What are they really connecting with? Um, what gets them more meaningful photos that they love to enjoy later? They love to reminisce, they love to share. So we look, at, we look at those things, basically. All right, I think we've got a few minutes left and I wanna make sure we get some questions. So now, I'm just gonna, I'm basically just gonna list feature demands of both of you. <laughs> Ouch. Um, it's gonna sting. Uh, it's not a total surprise because I tweeted it and I know they both saw it. 
But let's, uh, <laughs> but like, you're still here, man. You're still on stage. The lights are on. The cameras are pointed. Yeah, Channeling you're not an audience. Yeah, Go for it. Like they're waiting for it. Okay. Let's hear it. So, Isaac, number one. With a bullet. So much. We talked about Instagram being at this, like, video platform. The Pixel is very much an excellent still camera. Why can't it shoot 4K24 or 4K60 video? 4K24 or 4K60. Yeah. Uh, why can't it do those things? I think the answer is that nobody needs those things. Wow. I shouldn't say nobody. Wow. I think Don't y'all own YouTube? Because <laughs> I feel like I know, I know some people who really think they need those things. Uh, so They're very influential. It's, it's one of the... They're, whenever you look at a camera, there's like... There's very strong drop-off. There's some things that everybody does all the time. That's, I open the camera, I press the button, I close the camera. Done. That's like 80% of people, that's 95% of what they do. And then there's 1% of people who wants this crazy other thing like a raw capture or 4K60 or something. So we're very much an 80% team. We love simplicity, we love democratizing photography. We want everyone to be uh, a really confident photographer. Um, and so we focus on, the, on those 80% pathways. So if we have time to invest in something, we're gonna invest in the default mode, default capture, things that 100% of people use. Um, there are people who really want 4K60, um, so I think we've heard the feedback loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna say never, <laughs> just not right now. Is that something your current phone could support if you needed to put the resources towards it, or is that way to year? You know, it's, a, it's another one of those nuanced answers because certain components in the phone could support it. Like, we have enough memory bandwidth to move that 4K60 resolution, right? That part works. Um, other parts don't. And so we could do something like give you a 4K60 that you can only record for uh, a certain number of seconds before it saturates some bandwidth capacity. Um, but right, that's not gonna meet the pixel quality bar. Mm. And so uh, 4K24 is the other one that everyone asked about, which is, uh, if my math is correct, less than 4K30. <laughs> so if you can do 4K30, could you just light up 4K24? Sitting here on stage, I have no particular reason why we could not do 4K24. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm told it's mad science. Um, oh my God. Uh, but I, I think I it's just, one number I think is it's smaller just simple than math. the other. Uh, this, all right. this whole thing is just a delaying tactic to make sure that Ashley doesn't, like, Literally, Ashley's list is way longer. <laughs> uh, but Robbie, okay, here's the number one one we got for Instagram: better compression. People want higher quality compression. They want more predictable compression inputs and outputs. Is that something you guys are thinking about working? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's something that we're constantly trying to tune. It's a really difficult thing to balance because we are all that we hear on one side all the time. We want my video to be higher quality on the playback. It seems kind of weird and like not quite as good as I'd expect it to be. But on the other side, well, if you had a packet loss environment and your battery was about to die and you were in the woods and your thing didn't post, you're like really pissed. And so it's a really, really difficult trade-off, but we're absolutely, absolutely trying to give you the, the best possible compression and, and quality for the conditions you're in. And like, I think as phones and connectivity gets better, it's just gonna improve over time. So we're working on it, it's hard. We, we don't get it right every time, but it's definitely something we're working on. Do you think that there should be like an Instagram pro mode? Where what would you want with it? I mean, I, these are, there's a lot of transcoding going on as you guys are talking about. Like, is there a mode where you could say, I'm giving you this file, I'm looking for these output settings for display on Instagram. Like you're willing to wait longer yeah. and like go on Wi-Fi and whatever. It's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I probably wouldn't build that today just based on the, the amount of people that probably want it. Um, but I think that's an interesting idea. All right, Ashley. What about your, do you really want the digitally remastered profile? Was that a real thing where your, your things get better over time? I think everybody wants everything okay. to get better over time for free. Okay. And it's, Unless it's does anybody movies. not want that to happen? Yeah, that was a cool idea too. That was pretty right. That was cool. Uh, all right, Ash. Oh, I mean, this is not about the camera. This is just my beef. <laughs> Go for it. You, you know, got, I, bring you this, I bring this up to you every time. I know. When are you getting rid of red receipts on DMs? We need them gone, Robbie. Need them gone. They need to be gone. Okay. Okay. We can, we can, uh, thank you for the feedback. Feedback is a gift. <laughs> Am I going to get but Instagram Pro really before she gets it? No, yeah, that know. is dark. Maybe it comes with Instagram Pro. <laughs> no. no. Oh, this is great. But this no, is a it's really a really good point. I mean, I think like, it's, it's, there's, there's, 
lots of ideas like that where frequently we hear this thing is so awesome and one of the main reasons I use it is because I finally have transparency into communication because the anxiety that people have. Who are these people? I'll tell you. I mean, have I'll a combo you. with them. So who, who, who want to see red receipts? Yes. People really get worried when they send DMs and like people, they don't know if people saw them or not. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, did they see them and not write back? Or did they write back? Or did they not? And it actually creates like a lot of like stress for people. And Instagram is in the business of trying to reduce that as much as humanly possible. But I get on the other side, it could create other stress. They read and they didn't write back. But at least just transparency. So oh, no, I, I don't that, want people to know I read their message. So just one way, one way. <laughs> that, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Isaac, I, I don't think this is actually your team specifically, but... Um, the Pixel 3 had an ultra-wide front camera. Mm. People loved it. And so this is like a, a very common feature request in the list is, why'd you take that away from me? Is that when you're thinking, I mean, this is an integrated product, right? Mm -hmm. So was your team involved in the decision to put what cameras where? Yeah, I, I specialize in the software side, but we're very, very closely connected to hardware um, for many, many reasons. But uh, so the group selfie cam on the Pixel 3 was loved so much that we made the only cam on the Pixel 4 a group selfie cam. So the, uh, if you look at the Pixel 3, they've got a narrow front camera and a very, very wide. Uh, and the one camera on the Pixel 4 is kind of in between, but it's much, much closer to the wide side. Is this one of those things where you changed it, but now there's not a slider to indicate that it's getting wider so people just don't realize it's happening? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not even joking. <laughs> okay. Uh, it nailed it's, it. It's, it's actually an interesting, it's an interesting thing. For, for example, um, if you take a picture in Pixel and then you can go kind of watch it process for a second or two, if you manage to catch it while it's processing, you can see it turn from this kind of noisy jumble into this really sweet high res, low noise image and people really like that pop. They like to look at it, they like to watch the software make it do its magic and make it better. Yeah. So people really do like to see you know, the magic of what they're getting. The other wide angle thing, obviously, is why isn't there a wide angle on the back? So that's another interesting one. And uh, so we sat back and we kind of asked ourselves, if, you had a, if you're a photographer and you had a 27 millimeter equivalent camera, which is basically, this, you know, everyone in the market, their default camera is about 27 millimeters, mm -hmm. what would they ask for next? And they basically would ask for maybe a 50 or an 85. And once they'd covered 1585, they'd, maybe then they go to ask for something wider or maybe something super long, like a 400. Um, I've shot with 400s and I always wanted more, like I wanted 600. Um, so when we released Super Res Zoom on the Pixel 3, which was all software, that got us to about 50. You add the second lens on a Pixel 4 and you put software on top of it, you get to about 85. So it's like having a third, bag in, a third lens in your bag, so to speak. It, at optical quality. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I put that in quotes because people think optical quality means like a certain thing and it's another very nuanced thing. Um, but uh, you know, we, just, we just sat back and thought, what do photographers want? And they want to walk around with a bag that has a 28, a 35, a 50, and an 85. And so that's what we built. But so you're in this moment now where it seems like a lot of photographers want that ultra wide too. I mean, just judging from my, the replies to my tweet. <laughs> were you like, this just isn't important, it's not a thing, we don't have to do it? Or was it, we're going to put our energy over here? Or was I, it, we, we, we max out a two on the back, because that's, that's the rule? No, there's, okay. there's, no, there's no particular rule like okay. that. And I, and I wouldn't say that it's not important either. Like, lots of photographers uh, actually met, one particular photographer on our team, like, loves wide-angle capture. That's his thing. Um, he likes to shoot with a 20 millimeter, which is, which is pretty wide. Um, but when you look at it and you say, if you already have a 27, what do you want next? What's the next things on your list? Going wider than 27 is usually not very common. Hmm. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna send you the tweet. <laughs> uh, Robbie, the next one, uh, tons of people actually. iPad app. iPad app. Question. <laughs> That's very, that I get more than probably almost anything. Uh, that's a big one. Yeah. Not right now. We'll, really? We'll, we'll, no, we're we're going to keep we're going to keep prioritizing and thinking about like what's going to be the most bang for the buck. Right now, there's a lot of things in core Instagram that we're trying to really build to get right. Um, we've built a lot of new things into the camera, a lot of new experiences we want to follow through with. We just launched a new product, Threads, around messaging. It's camera first. Those are the areas we're focused on right now. Does, does Mark Zuckerberg have an iPad? 
I find a lot of iPad apps are built because like CEOs are like, I don't need a I'm laptop. Sure. I'm just like gonna do Outlook and like yeah. get through my day. Uh, I mean, this is this is my theory of iPad app development. I don't know if it's actually true. It's just what I believe. Um, but now there's like Catalyst, right? Like we just had Kayvon from Twitter on our on the show, and he was like, "Yep, Catalyst means we can build a Mac app. We have an iPad app. We can go right here." Does that expand your market? Does that change your thinking? I think at it's all? something that makes it a little easier. Like we're definitely gonna look at it probably a little bit more over time. I think it's just when you look at the core use case, like why do you use Instagram every day? It's like you got these few seconds. You're in between like where you're moving, and you open up your phone. It's very mobile oriented. Everything from the expectation of resolution, crop, how the whole thing is considered, it's mobile first. And it's really a communication oriented product. So yes, I think it would be pretty rad to have like a big visual experience you could just kind of go through, um, but it's secondary right now. But we'll, I, we'll, we'll keep thinking about it, particularly as the tools get better over time, it makes it easier, and we'll keep, we'll keep revisiting the question. But right, so you hear about the iPad app all the time, and you're like, yep, it's not worth it. Yeah. Because I mean, there's so many. I mean, there's a lot of users on the on the core product, and the things that they need just out of Instagram every day. If I could also show you the things in my inbox and DM and the reports from Instagram, you'd be like, "Wow, yeah, go fix those things." I would love. I would love yeah. to see that. Ashley. Yeah, uh, Ashley, do you want to ask this question? I've got a long Ashley list here. Oh, uh, well, this is still about DMs. Yeah, I mean, I know. <laughs> Clearly, I'm very back. oriented you love on DMs. DMs. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm into the DMs. You you're, 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 all right. <laughs> um, DMs on the desktop. I hear this a lot because you have the web app, great stories are on there, which is awesome. Why no DMs? Yeah, I mean these are these are the types of things that are hard when you know there's tools are going to be useful for, for useful for people, and like I wish we could make them because people some people would probably enjoy them. But then when we look at the actual web usage, just in general, across Instagram traffic on dub 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 versus the the mobile app, it just never really makes it worth the trade off of time um, because of the relatively small amount of people that we think will probably use it. All right, I got one more for you. Go. Why are no front cameras stabilized? Oh, that is actually a great question. Yeah. That's a fabulous question. Uh, Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first question. Someone, it up. someone it else, up. someone from Twitter asked that question. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach into what hardware knowledge I have um, and say that when you are building a camera, I should say when you're building a phone, you have all these different constraints to deal with. And uh, every little bit you add to the camera basically makes it larger. And you'd be surprised, actually. So if you, make, if you want to make the camera wider, for example, you have to also make it taller, just because of how light bends. That's just a reality of the situation. You can't only make it you know, wider in one dimension. Um, the OIS modules, uh, they actually, it's crazy. You actually build a module around the module. You hang the inner module on springs. And then you put these little uh, magnets on each side of it and use the magnets to like align it, the module within the module. And it's really hard to do OIS in the front, OIS in the back, multiple cameras, the whole uh, front facing kind of unlock feature, plus a speaker, plus a thin bezel, plus a radar chip, which is in Pixel 4, and have that OIS in the front and have it all kind of fit in the package. So. You're right. If you took like a huge sensor and put it on the front and had OIS and all the things just like you did on the back, you'd probably get better pictures on the front. But in this whole game of prioritization and, and how things have to get slotted into the phone, it ends up being really, really hard to do something like that. All right. Bonus, bonus, I'm going to see if I can do better than the rando from Twitter. Uh, is the front camera actually more important than the rear camera? Both. You should answer this question. In general. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. I'd say yes. And that's just because of what you're seeing? I think that, like, uh, it's, it's hard. I, I jump to yes. Yeah. But I think that when you see people and the emotion and, the, and, and yourself, like, I have a 15-month-old daughter, and the amount of times that I just have selfies with her because I'm just by myself, probably the most valuable things on my phone versus I'm trying to think of the things I take with my back-facing camera, and I feel like they're less human, they're less about the people in my life, and I'd probably be willing to get rid of them more easily than the things that I've taken on my front-facing but that's just my personal kind of take. I yeah, actually, you're stuck. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not stuck. <laughs> I actually do think the rear is more important. Okay. And uh, one of the big reasons why is when people turn their phone to me and they swipe through their pictures, maybe this is just the people I hang out with, but they don't show me selfies. They show me pictures of their kids. 
right? Hanging out, trick or treating, because it's Halloween today, right? Kids trick or treating, it's rear facing cameras. But by the way, we both did that today. <laughs> <laughs> I, trick- I did that right before I came here. I was trick or treating with my daughter. <laughs> uh, it's just a more flexible camera. You can do more with it. Um, you, if you only have, like, if you could only have one, a front or a rear, I think you'd choose rear. I don't know. I, I think that's. T- I mean, I, I'm still the person who carries around like four cameras. So like, I, it's like which of which of my babies do I have to give away? Um, yeah, I think you're right. But I would pick it because it is the best camera. But if I had to pick a like, where is the best camera pointing? I would almost certainly want it. You get the back facing quality face the other way. Yeah. Have you got, have you seen that like wild Asus phone that like the motor is over? It's great. I mean, it's great. It's, it's like, the best. what is the best thing about Android? It is that people get to make insane <laughs> hardware, right? And like ship it. And like Asus was like, what if, what if this thing rotated around? And I, that to me is like, okay, well, this is definitely going to break. Uh, this is probably not a good idea, but like, uh, I'm super into it because I get to take the highest quality photo this way. And I think that it's, it's actually a, I think that conversation is going to change over time. All right, I want to make sure you get questions from the audience. We've got a microphone over there. Raise your hand. We'll get it to you. Here we go. Uh, yeah, so this question's for Robbie. Just anecdotally, uh, I've seen a lot of people on like my Instagram feed use a lot less uh, filters. So I'm just kind of wondering, like, this was like a really original feature of uh, Instagram. How does that affect like the product as it's being developed? That like this original feature is essentially something that people don't want to use anymore. Yeah. I think filter usage is going down for sure. And people used to have these like really heavily stylized, bordered photos. Interestingly, it is coming back a little bit. Um, Particularly younger folks are using these like very like vintage style, like old film kind of things. So I wouldn't go as far to say that people aren't using it. Um, I think it's just evolving. But I do agree that it's definitely not the everyday use case anymore where you have this like very stylized photo. And how it affects product is, we, we try not to make that a really key aspect of something that we expect everyone to use. So for instance, on Stories camera, you have to swipe into some filters. It's not even the default setting and they're actually not very discoverable in a lot of ways. And I think on Feed, we've made it a little easier for people to swipe to tune those down a little bit and we also usually revisit the tuning of them um, over time as well. Just Wait, to, you can to, turn down the filter in yeah, the stories? The few, the, yes, the intensity of it. If you tap on the filter, it'll have a little slider, and you can turn it down on a percentile basis. Wait, and is that in the grid or in the stories? Uh, in the grid. Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry, I thought there was yet more <laughs> hidden UI in stories. Not in stories. Which is another <laughs> list of questions I have over here. All right. We had somebody over here. Uh, Thanks for doing this, by the way. Um, I'm curious about how do you guys think about not just the photos like that you're taking right now and the trends that are happening now, but in the future when people look back through their feeds and back through their photos, like what are the feelings or like uh, experiences that you want to have when people do that? Because like looking at my Instagram from like five years ago, it's cluttered with like these crazy filtered, uh, you know, like super desaturated photos. And I wonder if like you build products around that. Sure. I mean, we, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a product manager for the Google Photos team, so I can't really, I can't really speak for them. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we like to call it reminiscing. So uh, I think you're talking about, like, having this style that you had five years ago that you no longer have, which is like, okay, the jeans went out of fashion. Like, that's a, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> um, but for us on Pixel, we're more about capturing the right uh, moment in time. So it's the right smile, the right... Uh, you know, the right look, the right gaze between two people in a photo that makes it real, a really meaningful moment. Um, and that's one reason, like, there are no filters in the Pixel camera app. They don't exist. You can't use one in the Pixel camera app. It's just about the memory. It's just about the moment. So luckily, that's not, like, an issue that we have to deal with of styles coming in and out over time. I think for me, we have, we have an archive feature um, for stories and for feed. So you can always put them in an archive, or you can just reminisce and keep scrolling too. If you don't, if you're not someone who um, uses archive, but I think for me, the main thing I'd want is to make it easier for you to relive happiness in your life. Because really, a lot of the reason people share on Instagram is these happy moments and things that they have that they want to connect over. And so I think if we actually could do a better job, if we had infinite resources, it'd be awesome in archive differentiating between my like ugly selfie 
happy photo of like the Nationals winning the World Series and a, a moment I do actually want to maybe see, or maybe I would want to see that one again, but probably not that version, maybe the nicer one. Um, it feels really nice to separate those and say, okay, these are the things I really want to relive. These were just funny, stupid things I put on Instagram I probably don't need to see again um, and be able to bubble those up in the right way um, and probably reconnect with um, the people that were a part of that as well. Because I do think there's an aspect of just kind of reliving experiences and, and nostalgia that just give people joy and it's just a really important thing and I wish we could do more there. Uh, hey, I have two questions. Uh, both of them are Instagram related, so I apologize. Um, but the first one is long term, hopefully, I guess. And then the second is shorter term. So like it's Armageddon. There's a giant meteor headed for the Bay Area. Wow. What is the game plan? Yes. I, you know, Vine died and I lost all of my vines and I'm so sad. You are people. What is <laughs> the plan for my Instagram grid photos? Number one, okay. am I going to get download them? Uh, number two is uh, the Instagram cosmetic surgery effect ban. How's that working? Like, how's that like thought process going? And I mean, people are uploading those things every day now, like user generated. Um, Kylie and all of her crew are using that holy bucks thing now, which is clearly like a snatch nose, lip injections. How is that existing? What's up? Okay, cool. Good questions. Uh, I'll you. take the last one first. So for people who don't know, the Instagram camera, um, opened up a series of uh, uh, effects for partners to be able to build feature uh, effects into the camera itself. This happened around um, around August. And a few of the effects that popped up that we didn't realize were gonna pop up actually were plastic surgery oriented effects that had markings and things that we think promoted plastic surgery. Absolutely not intended or something that we support on the Instagram platform. Well-being and people's well-being is our absolute top priority. If we don't have that, we have nothing. So we've removed those. They're not complying with our current standards. And we're still looking at how to make sure our policies make sure that things like that don't exist in the future too, because that's important. And it's a process that we're working through. So that's the, the first answer. But those types of filters are not supported by Instagram, and we're removing them. On the um, other filter, or the other question about Armageddon, I think... Is it more of a data backup question? Like, how do you get your stuff out? Okay, so, like, when Vine died, we had, like, I don't remember how much time they gave us, but they were like, hey, Vine's collapsing. Um, if you want to download your videos for, like, archival purposes, here's your link. If you don't do it within X amount of time, your videos are dead to the world and you can never access them again. So it's Armageddon. Instagram is dying. All of our... I've had an Instagram since, like, 2010 or whatever, 11. Um... What's going to happen on my photos? Am I going to have an option to download them? Or yeah, I mean, we would, I mean, the way we would approach this is these are, these are you own is it. Is there a this plan your, in place? Your, these are your content. There's not a plan for the meteor plan. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe think about it. You're, you're raising good questions. Uh, <laughs> and so no, I think the way we would, we would solve it is to give you, I mean, you, we work for you. Like, you, they're your photos. You should be able to have them. It should be easy to, for you to get them and keep them safe. Do you think we about keep data them pretty safe for you? That way, though? What like, is should you build that now for data portability? Yeah, why can't we just do that right now? I think that is probably something. I think that, that is something. <laughs> you know, like right yes. now. <laughs> this started out so great. We're like, what's a photo? And now it's like, let me download my phone. Download your photos. <laughs> you can download your photos. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's something that we're going to look at. I think part of data portability and just in general, just good hygiene should be something we support over time. I think it would just be just a question of exactly when we could get it done. But it's something I'd like to see. Um, for the filters question, like, where is the line with that? Because it might not be explicitly a plastic surgery filter, but something that makes your face thinner. And like teens who are growing up literally only seeing filtered faces, how are you, and you guys care a lot about bullying and all that. Like, how are you thinking about mental health going forward and where the line is on what filters are allowed on the yeah, platform? Yeah, it's a great question. Historically, like when we built filters for ourselves, we did not have filters that altered or like changed the size and shape of your face. Um, and like that was important. Um, and I think as we're developing and having more and more of these filters occur, having a whole partner ecosystem, we got to take a hard look at this. Like, I think it's going to be a really important set of questions about how people view themselves and questions of beauty and self-confidence. And it's a very tough line because on one side, we hear from users all the time, wow, I felt really self-conscious about how I looked. I put this cute thing on and it made me happy and I put it on Instagram and then people said I looked amazing and it made me feel great. And I got to connect with three people that I haven't talked to. And we're like, oh, that's awesome. On the other side, you hear... Stories like what, we're, what, you're, what you're mentioning. Um, and so I think it's just finding that balance and be something that we have to continue to do. 
Um, and so we've been looking at both policy and also the types of effects that we're seeing, and also working a lot on ranking. So when you look at the effects gallery, it's really important the things that we actually are discoverable and are ranked are things that we think really match the use cases of like sharing what you love, feeling good, being goofy, and those types of things, which is what our camera really is for, and not for things that really the camera is, is we don't think the camera should be for. So I actually want to ask that question, Isaac, too, because there are, there are other cameras from other phones that sort of automatically beautify you. That's a thing we see all the time. Is that, do you guys have that conversation where it's like there's a line of, okay, well, noise reduction sort of just smooths your skin, so if it's a light, you're just like, it's happening to you, great, accident, versus we actually need a beautification mode to go compete in some of the markets where that stuff is the standard. So we do actually have a, we call it face retouching, not beautification, I'll, I'll tell you why in a second, but um, we do have a face retouching feature that's actually on by default. Uh, but it has a toggle, and if you turn it off, it's off. Like, straight, there's no, there's no games, it's off, off. Um, the reason we call it retouching is uh, we don't think of it as beautification. Um, there are lots of apps that will let you make your face thinner, make your lips bigger, your nose smaller or larger, like whatever you want to do to your face, it'll make your face look like that. Um, we don't do any of that. So there are certain lines that we won't cross. So what you're getting at, absolutely, yes. When we sat down and made face retouching, we thought, uh, well, first we went and talked to a bunch of wedding photographers. Because that's like your most important moment on your most important day where you have to look you know, good but you because you're going to be looking at it for the rest of your life. And we asked them, what do you do for people on their wedding day? When they've already put in all the effort to make themselves look amazing, which lots of people do every morning. And we tried to emulate what they were doing. And so that's something we're willing to turn on by default. What, what, what are the specific things that you do? Um, so the big one is skin smoothing. That's like the most important thing. Uh, but there are nuances to how you do skin smoothing because um, they're like these, we call them frequency domains, but it's basically there are very, very small features on your face, like pores, um, and that's like very high frequency. And then there's stuff like splotches. Like if I had sat here for this whole interview like this, I would have this giant red splotch on my face. And the pores are part of you, but the splotch is not. So we try to be kind of intelligent at how we correct, uh, not correct, but like we take away the parts, you know, what, what you look like today that isn't you. It's like whatever happened to you today, we try to take that away and make you look like you just, you know, walked out of the bathroom in the morning and looked really great. So we have actually lots and lots of thinking and like I'm thinking of multiple documents and slide decks that, that we've created thinking about where that line is and why it should exist that way. And we worry about a lot of the same problems that Robbie does on Instagram. Yeah, wow. I, I, my wedding re photographer retouched the hell out of our photos, and like that's like par partially the nightmare, right? Is like some people are, have a very heavy hand. Were you thinking about them actually retouching the photos, or what you looked like on the on the wedding day? Sorry, what do you say it again? It's like our I don't mean our wedding photographer is great. You should, everybody hire him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're really fun. Can you imagine the nightmare of being my wedding photographer? And I was like, what camera are you using? Um, <laughs> they were very patient with us. Uh, <laughs> But like they retouched the photos afterwards. Are you thinking about that process, the Photoshop process, or you got made up and you're beautiful in the morning? Oh, we're thinking about the Photoshop process. Okay. Yeah. Like, so we don't change the shape of your face. We don't change the color of your face. We don't give you lipstick. It's, it's about uh, kind of raising the shadows. Um, it's called. It's kind of raising the exposure, so you look a little. You have that. There's this wonderful thing that we call the glow, when you called take highlighter. Huh? Highlighter. <laughs> <laughs> Women have figured this out. <laughs> we try to do the glow without that. Uh, but we try to capture the glow, which has a lot to do with exposure and tone mapping and a little bit of, a little bit of skin smoothing. Um, uh, and it, it ends up making people look like how they see themselves. Because when you look in the mirror, it, you know, some people have those crazy curved mirrors for doing makeup, right? And you can actually, that's like intentional, so you can see the pores. Most people, you stand five feet away from a mirror, look at yourself in the morning, and you go, I look good. Wow. I am so fascinated by your focus groups. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. We uh, want to replicate that feeling. Okay. We're way over time, but I, I wanted to end on this question because we started with the big existential question about what's a photo. What actually happens next with cameras and photos? What's the thing that we're on the cusp of that hasn't happened yet, but you can see is potentially another paradigm change, like computational photography was a paradigm change, like sharing with a mass audience like Instagram was a paradigm change. What's the thing that you see coming? Isaac, we'll start with you. That's a large question. 
Yeah, you got like four seconds. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I actually think that there's a lot of quality left. Like, and I mean quality in like a very, if you zoom out the picture and you look at the whole thing on a, you know, on a little phone screen that's realistically not going to get much larger than your hand ever, um, there's a lot of stuff that we can do like on a subjective side. Um, you don't have to pixel peep to go find it. There's a whole lot left to do there with color, dynamic range, um, uh, all the tone mapping stuff that we do in HDR Plus to uh, make scenes look more like you remember them and not like a camera took them. Robbie. The last point he made took my point, <laughs> which was, I mean, I, I'm really surprised still, actually, just based on how quality the technology is and how much time and effort goes into this. Now, there is still a diff when you take a photo and you're like, I don't remember that looking that way at all. Um, either it's the lighting or low lighting environment or it's people's faces when you actually look at someone's face and you just look at the photo and it really doesn't look like the person necessarily. Um, and I do think the more we can converge those and potentially if you introduce other types of more immersive capture formats, potentially like in the AR VR space, you really get a really relived potential experience which I think would be really exciting for people. That's great. Well, thank you both so much for doing this. Thank you all for coming. I got to say, this is thank like, you. Thanks. why does the Verge exist for this extremely nerdy conversation on <laughs> camera? So thank you for <laughs> indulging so us on our birthday. This was absolutely brilliant. Thank, thank you for coming out. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you. Rock and roll. Paul. Paul. <laughs>